So now that we've gotten through the basics of how React works, and it looks like everything is all rosy, and we can just render frame to frame to frame and have the browser look just like we want, uh, we get to the first fly in the ointment, which you reach very quickly, uh, inputs. Um, and we're going to talk about why that's a fly in the ointment in this video, along with some of the things you end up having to do about it. So I've got a uh, new project set up essentially identically to the one in the last video, so you can go and review there. And I've wrapped up uh, JavaScript's request animation frame in a little ARIA function just so I can type it quickly. Uh, I've still got the uh, mount point. Uh, I've renamed this mount point looking at in my index file here when I load my index.html. I've got a div with an app ID. Uh, I'm loading my main JavaScript. I'm also pulling in semantic UI uh, CSS just to make it easy to make something look reasonably good in my in my demo here and then I've also still got my render function from the last where I'm just calling plain react dom render on an element at my fixed mount known mount point um, and I'm going to play with simulating kind of the way Fulcro works uh, and for that matter a lot of the other libraries that wrap React, how they have to work and what they have to do, uh, just to give you an idea of how this how this whole thing puts together. So the very simplified view here. So I'm going to make an atom that has a closure script map in it that has my first name in it. And I'm going to do a def once on that so hot code reload doesn't cause this to get reset every time hot code reload happens. So def once is basically just a def, but it checks to see if the thing's already def, and if it is, it doesn't do it. So that's nice. I'm going to make a function I'm calling UI form that just has, uh, and remember we saw in the last video, these are just Fulcro's uh, macros slash functions that emit the most efficient form of create element they can. And there's this nice little shorthand for adding in classes to the thing. So I'm going to put a UI container class, which causes semantic UI to um, make wide things not look so wide. I'm going to wrap a little form here and put a header on it, put a field, and then that field a label. And here you see I'm, I'm doing something a little different. Instead of using the raw, not the raw, the fulcro function for input, I'm just using a fulcro create element, which just is the raw react create element to make my input. I'm doing that because fulcro's input in the DOM namespace is special, and it's special for a reason you're about to understand. So. Let's take a look at what happens here. So I've coded a few other things, very simple things. I made a UI root that now takes props, where I'm going to call this form and pass it its props. So the UI form takes props and it expects to get a first name. So the first thing you'll notice is I'm not having this form reach into this top level app state because I want to be able to kind of move forms around, so on and so forth, reconstruct things. So I don't want to tie my UI shape to my database data shape necessarily. I mean, you can, but it's a nightmare to maintain such an app. Uh, that's why Fulcro has normalized databases for that sort of thing. It's, it's insane to manually maintain the shape of that and morph it every time you decide to refactor part of your UI. Okay, so if we uh, we've got this started up, if we go here and go to the builds, start the build, and then we can go to localhost dev server, we can load this HTML, which of course, um, I'm going to sort of do a side-by-side -side thing here, see, here and see if I can get away with it. All right, so we've got our build going, we've got our little form, we can still go down here and say, okay, render our, oops, I don't have a REPL going, haha. <laughs> so we're going to create a remote REPL, we're going to hook it up to localhost, 9000, just like we did before, and that's just a well-known port that hooks us to our compiler. I'm going to run that, and then we're going to tell the Shadow CLJS system that we'd like a REPL for our app. It's going to say, okay, you're in CLJS, you're running there, and now we can render, and it tells us no, and that's probably because we haven't loaded this with Shadow hooked up yet. There we go. Well, it liked it that time didn't render. Let's open our console and make sure we don't have... There we go. Just 
there's some stale stuff that was in the cache. Always a good idea to have your dev tools open uh, with uh, uh, the cache disabled when your uh, when your dev tools are open, and that way you won't get stale files from the last time you were developing something different. Uh, okay, so we've got that rendering, but of course now if I change this and I save it, I get the hot code reload, which has updated my code, but my UI is not going to change until I go down here and render it again. Well. That's kind of annoying. What I'd like to have is a render loop. So we can make a really, really simple one. That's why I have request animation frame setting here in an RAF function. We could say when I call start, request an animation frame that calls this function, which has the name next frame star, render the UI root, and then request another animation frame and run next frame. So it sort of looks like a recursive call, but it's actually like we drop off the bottom of this function and then 16 milliseconds later or so, because this this guy runs at roughly a 60 frame per second timing rate. And so that'll cause my application just to re-render basically um, 60 times a second. So I'm going to go down here. I'm going to see start. You notice the UI immediately updated. Uh, but now if I go and tinker with my, my form it on hot code reload, it immediately updates. So great. Um, and I'm not sure what's eating up my CPU because it was doing, this is my little CPU meter. Uh, it was doing that before. Uh, oh, the screen capture. <laughs> the screen capture is eating up most of the CPU, so when you see that going there, that's not actually the browser eating up much CPU because this 60 frame a second, right, one of the powers of React is it can look to see, oh, nothing's changed, I don't have to do anything, so it does very little work on these, these frames. This is not, by the way, how Fulcro does animation frames. This is just, a, again, a really simple emulation of how you get a React application that can react to data. So uh, I've got my raw plain Jane input here. The value is coming from the prop's first name. Notice that's a closure script map, and I'm destructuring it. And my render loop here is using this atom to supply that. So that means if I go down here and change first name to Bob in the state, you see the input change. All right, great. So now I have a global way to have some sort of external mutation of my application state and have that affect the UI that doesn't necessarily have to be tied to the locale of that uh, operation. So for example, I could have uh, you know, a reset button or something in a different component that knows I want to clear a form and it could go through and clear the state and then the form would just update. So that is the kind of thing that you want. Now, of course, you also want to, to grab the on input or on change events here. Um, and actually, let me show you something else first. Let me comment out those those forms so I'm not changing uh, uh, first name at all. If I go over here to the form and I try to type, maybe you can hear me typing, nothing happens. How does React do that? And, and what is an input in a browser? So they, these are the questions that I really want you to think about when you're thinking about how React works and what something like Fulcro or any other library that, that wraps React has to deal with with respect to this particular concern. And that's that this input is generated by the browser, in this case Chrome, and it supports all sorts of things. It supports figuring out how to render your font, uh, it keeps track of, of event handlers, and it's got its own mutable state. So when you set a value on um, an input, you're actually putting a value into a mutable cell, and normally when you type, the browser is updating that mutable thing for you. Right? You can ask for the value at any given time, and it's just there. You don't have to put it there. The user's putting it there. You also have support for things like internationalization, where there's like input methods on the operating system, and et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot of low-level C or C++ or some right, lower-level language, probably, uh, that the browser was written in. And it really owns that, that input, and that input is a mutable thing. So the fact that when I try to type into this input, and React is trying to make it look like I get to render exactly what's there, uh, or exactly what's in my state, and, and that's all that will ever render there, um, that's actually a bit of, uh, of an illusion. So to show you that, I'm going I'm to reload the page to stop my render loop, because my render loop would interfere with the example that I'm trying to show you. I'm going to render things once. Um, right. 
read-only field. That's exactly what I want. Okay, so now I've only rendered once. I don't have my render loop running, and you can see that when I go up here and try to type, right, I can even highlight things and hit backspace, like it doesn't change. But my thing's not rendering, and I'm running, and I'm not asking React to render anything. So what the heck's going on, right? How is that? How is that thing that field that's owned by the browser and is actually a mutable thing uh, not updating when I bang on it? And the answer is, of course, if you go to the elements and look at the input, I could have done this much quicker just by saying inspect. Um, and then go look at the event listeners. It turns out that React has glommed onto a bunch of these things. In fact, it gloms onto all of them, right? And this input one, these these handlers here. If I delete them from input, um, well, now I can type now. So the the answer to the question is, React puts its own event handlers on everything, captures the events, and then prevents the change from happening. So that's how it gives you the illusion that you're in control of the value of the field. Now the place this illusion breaks down, I'm going to reload this so I haven't screwed over React's state. Oh, I should leave that open just so I don't get weird caching. Um, where the illusion breaks down um, is when you start modifying these form fields. So let me start my render loop again. I'll get my form going. And I'll put in my on change handler here. And so now you can see what I'm doing is I'm looking at the target value of the event. Now this is a low level JavaScript object. So this is just a little wrapper function that says, you know, get the target value. Kind of silly. But it keeps it from showing up as a as a warning like these do, right? Because it doesn't know the IDE doesn't know all of the possible things you can call in JavaScript. So it's just saying, I, I don't know, is that really something you can call? So that's the only reason I use that here. And then I'm just going to swap on this state atom and say, associate a new value onto the first name key and make it the, the string that came out of that, that event. All right, so now I should be able to start putting new values into this input. All right, great. Now the problem comes in when I try to go to the middle here, I'm, and I'm going to press the letter H. Notice where my cursor went to. It jumped to the end. This is a rather rather annoying uh, feature, so to speak, of React for developers of libraries that try to do what things like Fulcro does. And that's that because the input is a mutable thing, and because the change to the state happened in an asynchronous event that didn't show up until the next animation frame, so let's just think about that, right? So, so maybe write a, a sequence of, of events here. So, one, uh, the event happens. Two, event handler updates the atom. Three, some time later, uh, you ask for a render and pass the new props. And four, React sees you've changed value and tells input its new value. All right, well, that's kind of what you expected, right? Um, that, that's sort of the sequence of events. The problem is some time has passed. And whenever an input in a browser, which the browser owns, when it sees you setting a new value, it thinks, oh, you're setting a brand new whole entire value for the user to see. It doesn't do some micro comparison to see that you've just changed the middle of it. It assumes the value is entirely brand new, and that was due to some other action that happened in the world that your user understands. Say, for example, uh, you know, a server push. Maybe you're doing collaborative editing, whatever, and it jumps the focus to the end of that thing that just appeared. And so this is, you know, right, quite annoying. People are trying to go and fix the middle of their thing, and their cursor keeps jumping. They can't even hit backspace without the cursor jumping to the end. Oh. So how does React fix this? How does React make this better? And the answer is they use component local state. That's the standard answer for how you fix this particular unfortunate problem that really is 
this this like mismatch between the mutable world of the browser input and what we're trying to pretend is I'm in control of exactly what the browser renders. Um, like those two things just they, in this particular case they don't pan out. So um, let's let's talk about React's trick for doing this. So I'm going to do this via hooks because I. Fulcro's component system actually adds in a bunch of extra things to the two components. So I'm just going to use raw, low-level uh, React hooks here. So React hooks let you define a component, like a true React component that can interact with the React APIs, as a plain function, but that function is going to receive JavaScript props. Um, so I'm not going to get my lovely closure script thing there, um, but I would like to have it, so I'm going to make a let paste that back in and I'm going to say you know what I'm going to put on my uh, uh, my props let's call it so dot dash my props on the JS props right so I'm using field access of the interop I'm going to put my my uh, closure script data structure in, inside of this sub element uh, so I can pass them in and destructure them okay that'll make my life a little nicer um, and I need now this UI root in order to render the UI form. This can't be UI form anymore. This needs to be the actual component. So that's my, my UI class, so to speak. And then I need a factory, which can react. Uh, see, that UI form takes the JS props, and we're going to call DOM create element. So we already seen that's just right. That's just React create element, and this guy takes the thing that you want to render. In this case, we want to render form, and then the JS props. Uh, you know what? Let's make that nicer. Let's take the. Let's go ahead and just let this be the interfacing layer. So we'll take closure script prop here, and what we'll, we'll do is we'll uh, um, we'll make a, uh, a JavaScript object and go ahead and put our in it. Okay, again, we're using a low-level JavaScript API, so we have to sort of play with the interop to get things to play nice. Okay, so now UI root gets closure script props, UI form gets closure script props, and then this guy is our factory that manufactures an element of type form with these props. Okay, so that should, I think, still work. What did I forget here? I cannot infer target type of We'll just say that for now. That'll get rid of the warning. Um, okay, so this should still mess up, but should still be you know working at the end. Okay, now what we can do is I've I've pulled in this hooks namespace because the hooks API has this lovely thing called. Uh, or it has a, this way of using component local state. So the current name and set name gets hooks slash use state of first name. So we're going to let the first name from the prop be the initial value of the component local state. And I'm literally just using the React hooks API here, low level JavaScript. Uh, this function uh, in hooks calls useState, and all it does is make it so that the return value of that, which comes back as a JavaScript array, turns into a closure script array so I can destructure it nicely. So it's, it's a very thinly, uh, so if you want to see how hooks work, go read the docs, but I'm about to show you. Okay. So what this returns is the current value of that state, which we've initialized to first name, and a function that lets you update it. So now instead of this, just this swap, we'll say set name to the new value. And here's the trick. When you tell React that a thing has changed via component local state, um, and it sees that thing you know, being used, we're going to use current name right here. Um, 
it knows what's happening. It can track what's happening. And so then when a value shows up that's the same that it's already put in there via component local state, it does nothing. So it assumes that you're in the situation of there's a rendering loop going on and you've already set component local state value to that. Um, and, and I can fix that for you. So let's reload here so I know I'm in a known good state. Let's start our render loop. And now I should be able to put my name in here, go back and put stuff in the middle and everything's working wonderfully. We think. Here's your next problem. What if you want to update the name now to Bob? Well, I just evaluated that. I can go and look at App State, and I can see App State as an atom that has Bob in it, but my UI did not update. Oh boy. So the fix, which fixes the form behavior, now breaks the other behavior I want, and that's that I want to be able to globally change my application state and have my rendering be a real representation of that. So this is kind of a painful problem. Um, either you go to the mutable world where you have to like ask this form for, you know, pass it a callback and have that callback tell you what the new value is and do a bunch of like conditional logic figuring out how the app state should update the Yada yada yada, right? So I could put an if statement in here that says, oh well, if you know, on component, right, I don't have lifecycle methods here, but I can use effects in hooks to do a little, you know, glamour playing where I can try to figure out, all right, does this value match the value that's already in current name? If not, then it probably changed, and then it, but there's a whole lot of it's really hard. It's hard to get this right. Um, if you really want this like global thing controlling an input, um, by definition you have to use component local state, but the logic around writing something that works in all of these cases is, it's, trust me, <laughs> it's, it's a nightmare. It took days of development work based on uh, somebody else's development work based on somebody else's work uh, to get something that, that worked well with Fulcrum. And Fulcro actually has uh, now has a synchronous transaction mechanism that works like uh, component local state, but doesn't have to use it, um, and and that gives you this the same effect without having to use component local state. But it was again uh, a lot of work to get that working. So I hope you kind of appreciate now uh, when you say DOM input and you get to use these nice little properties and you get to actually change uh, some global atom, uh, this input is actually in regular mode a wrapped input which is a wrapped form element around an input which on the fly generates uh, an instance of a new component with various lifecycle methods uh, in order to wrap your component in such a way that it does all the comparisons and state management, etc., so that your input works right. And this is the same sort of thing that you need, and in fact this is a public function because when you use the React ecosystem, right, you go grab some custom thing that acts like uh, an input, like React number format. Right, this guy, uh, this guy has, is a very useful one that I use in some projects. And it lets you do, you know, just a whole bunch of settings on on forms to get really nice, you know, formatted numbers. Well, this guy acts the same way and expects you to be using component local state. And so you can actually use this React wrapper that I've built in Fulcro DOM to make these behave properly uh, when using state. So that's the trouble with inputs. Uh, let's let's go ahead and see. Uh, hopefully. <laughs> He says, having not tested this particular method of doing things, let's reload this, having not tested it in this like weird little simple render loop that we're playing with here. Uh, so let's start our render loop. Uh, notice we don't have, uh, we can just get rid of this component local state mess. Uh, we can put back our first name. Lovely. That'll hot code reload our UI should be able to put our things in here and we should now 
be able to edit in the middle without problems. And our state, of course, should be updated. And if we change this to Bob, it immediately changes. So there's a decent amount of magic, and the moral of the story, going on behind DOM input. And this is also the kind of magic that you need to know about if you're going to use the React ecosystem to supply any sort of input. So for example, I use Semantic UI React because I use Semantic UI in a lot of my projects. And the Semantic UI React controls, again, their form-based form controls do the same thing. Uh, they, they expect you to use component local state because that is the official way from React to deal with form elements. Um, but it's also a very painful, mutable, uh, tying your state to a component where it's hard to get to sort of way to do it that requires you to then couple things um, tightly and I don't know, you know, all the different reasons why you might look at a system like Fulcro that has a normalized database where you can think about your data model separately from your rendering model and the rendering model can just be a pure expression of your state. Um, so this is another reason why uh, you know I, I say Fulcro is one of the it's one of the only, it's in fact the only library I know of that does React rendering that's that's quite so literal on the the state is what gets rendered. Right? You can use component local state, right? And you can you can in fact there are places where I do use component local state, uh, and that breaks that model. Uh, but for the most part, your entire application is meant to be this expression of a snapshot of an immutable data structure that represents what you want to render. Uh, in the state atom, and these are just the details of how it should look. 